Before you go down Greenspan, we want to just eliminate the debt ceiling. Oh, absolutely. Here you go. The ability of almost every working American to access more credit than they should have been able to mask the underlying fact that lower and middle class incomes were not rising. That's not a tenable so strategy. Is now the time to eliminate it? Oh, we've been time a long time ago. Let's put aside terrorism. Let's talk only about our own homegrown animals that are patrolling America right now. So it goes down to the simplest thing. Be prepared, be vigilant. People are sick. People are sick of the media. People are sick of politics. People are sick of the government. People are sick of the local government. People are sick of representation. People are sick at all levels. Sick and tired in this nation. The trust is as is so far gone. Right? People are sick of the rich. People are sick of the poor. People are sick of the homeless. People are sick of the uh, people with 70 homes and jets. People are sick of climate change. People are sick of extinction of animals. It, it seems whichever direction we go in this nation, there's a, a disenfranchised group attached to that direction. To me, to me, I see anarchy in the making. That's what I see. To me, I see anarchy in the making. I see a time quickly approaching where there is no trust. There is no trust in our neighbor. You know, in the days of Stalin, where you were, or Hitler rather, when you were either or, where you were supposed to spy on your neighbor and report your neighbor, I see a time coming where there's just simply no trust. Maybe there's no report, but there's no trust in the common man, no trust in, the, in your, even your neighbor. It's a frightening thing to think about when you see all the institutions of America falling to the wayside. And it's hard not to mock them. It's hard not to mock. J. Johnson, J. Johnson, the Department of Homeland Security uh, whiz leader, when we've never been more insecure in the homeland. Not in my lifetime. I don't care what you say. I have never seen more insecurity in my lifetime than I have seen. So how do you not mock that? See, because if you keep your mouth closed about an institution and pretend like it's going right, that's just as destructive. In fact, that may cost more lives. I don't know. But what I will say is, now maybe maybe you have to give the guy, you have to give the guy, the benefit of the doubt because his leader, his boss, is bringing in unvetted Syrian refugees, and, and we don't know what the guy says behind closed doors. I have to imagine and I have to pray that there's at least one voice in the room with the president when he says, well, we're going to bring in 10,000. At least one voice that says, well, they could potentially be terrorists, Mr. President. A handful of them could kill Americans. And I'd love to hear the response of the president. I'd love to hear the response. Now, like never before. People are listening to what people like, well, to what talk radio and podcasts are saying. You know, you got to give the government that. They know where to snoop. They know where to go for ideas. They know, they know where the heartbeat of the nation is. They know it's not on NBC. They know it's not on NBC with their little galas and their little jazz festivals at the White House. They know that there's 10,000 people watching that and that's all. President Obama understands the anarchy that's afoot. He understands it because whether he meant to or not, he did put some of it in in, uh, in position here. I mean, when you talk about anarchy, well, let's go after guns, let's go after police, let's go after the very core things that keep Americans safe and, and allow you to sleep at night. You know, the only reason we sleep at night 
is because we're allowed to keep weapons to protect ourselves and we have the, uh, the thin blue line between us and those who want what we have. That's it. You take those two away and it goes back to shifts. It goes back to sleeping shifts where the wife is up from 8 o'clock to 12 and then uh, the husband goes, goes to bed for a little while and wakes up and, and he's, he watches the home from 12 to 4. We're not that far removed from these crazy things we read about in, in dystopian fiction books or these things we read about in, in prepper fiction. Right? Where, where trust, police force, and firearms, you take those three out and, and that's where we'll sit. We'll sit in a place where we're so terrified. And when you look at that, you look at trust. Right? The most peaceful president of all time, Barack Obama, the peacemaker. <coughs> Didn't he get a Nobel Peace Prize or something for fighting against nuclear missiles? How many wars? We're on the doorstep of a war with Russia. If we keep it up. Why? And here, here, let me tell you, let me break down Putin's position for you. Because I think I can understand where this guy's coming from. Based on his desire to see this next seated president be Donald Trump. Now think about this. Think about it from his standpoint. Does Putin want a war with America? Highly unlikely that he wants to fight America in a, in a serious war. He knows exactly what the forces are like. He knows what it could mean to his people as well as ours. But at the same time, he's not going to be trampled on like our president has been for the last eight years. He's not going to bow. He's not going to get on his hands and knees and praise someone else. So he has to posture. And then our president being, I don't want to go on a tirade about our president. We all know it, how it's been. Especially when it comes to the security and the serious uh, understanding of what needs to happen in this world stage. Barack has been rough, right? He's been, he's been at, at minimum rough. So why does this guy want to see Trump become the seated president? Well, we know that Donald Trump, if anybody's going to go to war, if anybody could, can wrap their head around war and understand that this guy with the big ego and the main madness... The egotistical mindset, Donald Trump will go to war. Right? You rub him the wrong way. That's that's one of my biggest fears. Is he's the type of guy who wars before thinking. Now, that said, we see Hillary's on the she's already at war. Right? She's called the guy Hitler. She said that she doesn't like him, a bad person. And maybe that's all true. But the fact of the matter is we beat Russia already. We know how to beat Russia. It's very simple. It's not a hard thing to do. Especially when you're an energy mecca like we are now. It's not hard. It's not hard. And we don't need a war. Right? We beat them in an arms race before. We drove them into the depression. We can sanction them. We could, we could take Russia out of the picture easily. Without having to fire nuclear bombs across oceans. And it seems like to me, I'm going to be honest with you, this is what I think. It seems like Putin is looking for Donald Trump to take a seat at the throne so they don't have to go to war. Because he knows he can sit down and talk to Putin. They can sit down and they can hash some issues out. That's what I think. I think he sees the war drums. I think he sees a bunch of insecure people running the world currently that want to, want to blow somebody up. I mean, you look at look at their history. They're killers. They're <laughs> they're warring killers. If you looked at the stats, if you took took away the names, if you took away Hillary Clinton as uh, Secretary of State, and you took away Barack Obama as President, and changed the names of those dead, right? And just said how many were killed in Afghanistan, how many killed in Iraq, how many killed in Libya, how many killed in Egypt. How many world leaders killed or attacked uh, or, 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 you know, militants armed and threatened? How many wars, right? How many terrorist organizations under attack or management? How many drone strikes? If you took a look at that, how many innocent lives lost? If you took a look at those numbers, you wouldn't even be able to realize, you wouldn't even be able to wrap your head around the facts. 
You would be so insane about what happened. You'd be saying to yourself, I don't know who, which president ever in history would have killed this many people, would have attacked this many countries, would have overthrown this many governments using backdoor tactics. But that's what it's been. That's what it's been. The people have seen it more than ever. And now the people are looking at this laughing stock election. And it's almost like the last straw. It's almost like we'll look back on this, uh, this day and say to ourselves, that's when it all really started to fall apart. And I can tell you, it's almost, it's almost even worse if Hillary Clinton does win. Because I think the level of animosity for the, for the system... The idea that she was supposed to be in, she comes from the long line of people who run things, right? She's fat, She's lined the pockets of so many and had her own pockets lined for her own deals, and she made her way into the White House. I think it'll so sicken people that it'll just add to the disenfranchisement and the anarchy that is to come. It has to come. It has to come for people to feel sane unless unless we get a president who can who can really change things. But I don't know. I don't know if I see it coming. I can't say that I see it. I can't say that I'm excited about it. And, and Barack comes out and tells us, with this disenfranchisement, there is an answer. Right? Because he recognizes. It's like I said. They recognize what's happening. They're not idiots. They recognize people don't like CNN. They don't like NBC. They, like, they don't like CNBC. They, none of that. The mainstream media has been been tortured to death on both sides. The advent of podcasts like mine and others has created a new avenue for news. Right? Nobody's out here selling a false... I mean, I'm sure there are people selling a false bill of goods, but you hear that quick and you, just, you don't listen to them. So he comes out and gives us the, uh, the answer. Barack comes out and gives us the answer to our, our, our distrust in the news. He called it the Wild West, the Wild West of the news era, with the podcasts and all these alter, alternative news sources. The Wild West, he called it. I like that. I like that. It's got to be reined in, right? It's got to be reined in. It's got to be curated, for his words. They need curators for the news. And where would they come from? Well, they would come from the government, right? Because, of course, whenever there's a real problem, and I've watched this happen all throughout history, if you read history at all. about, especially with, It usually ends in incredible amounts of death. But whenever there's a real problem in a nation, the only answer is the government. The only answer is government. Oh, it's too much news? Let me step in here. We'll funnel that for you. We'll pick out all the things we don't want you to know about and throw them in the trash. And then you can get a nice clean stream of news that'll make you smile and go to sleep quietly and keep paying taxes. That's always a good answer. Government is always... We'll curate the news for you. <laughs> You've got a government of people here that no one likes, no one respects, but they're going to take care of the news and massage it just the way it should be. Just the way it should be, just the way that you'll enjoy it. So that being said, that's the, that's the president's idea of how to fix this whole thing. Right? It's not self-reliance, it's not independence, it's not the idea that we don't need we don't need one line to follow. With freedom there are many lines to follow and that's it. There are many lines to follow. Maybe we don't need certain news tidbits and news briefs and news bits. But the government has the answers, don't you worry. Don't you worry. Coming up on today's show, I want to talk about the Jamai. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Jamai Al Hadou Girls Islamic School in Nottingham, London, which is closing. Reports say it is closing because it has become what we've all feared. Even though everyone told us it wouldn't happen, and it's not about the religion, and it's not about you know, peace loving people. You know, and it's not about that, and it's a very small percentage, and only that very small percentage is going to do a very bad thing. We're going to talk about why this school's hatred for gays and lesbians 
and uh, its incessant banning of things is, is going to push it to close. Because it was on a small route to Sharia law, let's be honest. Now, I want to get into that because that's a juicy story. That's an interesting story to me. That's a story that people have been shouting, that people have been Paul revering about for a very long time, that it was only a matter of time until these things, this indoctrination began. My question to you is, how do we, how do we survive this with the enemies at the gates? I'll tell you what, it really is sad to watch old Bernie, man. You watch old Bernie, man, it's it's a sad thing to see. I was never a big supporter, but God. I mean, he played a pretty good game for a while there. Right? He played a pretty decent game. He had a lot of young people believing in him, that man. That man was prepared to take everyone's money and give it out to other people. He was prepared to do a whole lot of wild stuff. That, but, but the saddest part was that he bucked the establishment so much. You know, he was so anti-establishment. And that's what we loved about him, right? That's what people, when I say we, I mean the American people. That's what the American people loved about this guy. They saw him as a departure from business as usual. Which, by the way, is also what we kind of, you know, many of the American people saw in Barack Obama when they voted for him. So knowing that he, he was socialist and unapologetic, he was anti-disestablishment and unapologetic, he came down on Hillary like, like no one ever has, I think, with the, that comment about the banksters and how he wanted to see the stra transcripts for her speeches to the banks. Brilliant, right? Now we see Bernie on the trail of tears. <laughs> Bernie Sanders is on the trail of tears, man, out there trying to make a case for, for a woman who he knows is corrupt. It's a sad thing to see an old communist go down in flames like this guy. An old communist warlord gone down in flames now, marched around by his party. His, 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 the Democrat Party is made up of such shameless people, it's unbelievable. And I don't get too much into Republican and Democrat, and you hear a lot of people say... They're both the same. They're one and the same. I will tell you this. Okay, I will tell you this much. There is far more character in the Republican Party than there is in the Democrat Party. When you look at the Democrats, you see a party of people who could be sold for a, a ginger snap. Just look at Bernie. Bernie was the king. He was the king. I've got buildings that I drive by on the way home with, with paintings of Bernie Sanders on them. And I say paintings. One of them, he actually has a Superman shirt on underneath his coat. The guy who never had a job till he was 70. I got to look at paintings of him on, on the Broad Street here in Virginia. Paintings, right? He sold an entire, an entire youth was sold on his game, on his communist lie, on his idea that he was, he was against the system. He was anti-politician. I'm about anti, I'm going to stop all this. Now what's he doing? He's back on the trail of tears, touting Hillary. Vote for Hillary. Vote for Hillary. Go against everything I said I did. I, I was and is and does. Vote for Hillary. She'll make everything better. You know, you gotta you gotta give credit where credit's due. And where's credit due? A guy like Donald Trump comes out, and at least there are Republicans up there who have enough character to say, you know what, I'm not for this guy. I'm not for what he believes in, and you know what? I'm not going to support him because of that. What you didn't see is Ted Cruz go out on a tr on on the campaign trail for Donald Trump, right? They had a they had a war. He came out the loser. He came out the lesser. And you know what? He said, "Screw that guy. 
I'm not for him. And I'm not going to support him either. I think he's bad for the country. Which Bernie said all those things about Hillary. But now he's backing her. And it's a sad thing to see. Like I said, to see an old communist go down in flames. <laughs> to see, a, see an old communist die a death that is anything but honorable. That's what we're watching here in Bernie Sanders. We're watching, we're watching him fizzle out because he's losing credit with everyone now. Who could vote for him now? If he came back in four years, who could vote for him? Who could say, oh, yeah, 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 okay. We'll run him against Donald Trump. Again, Donald Trump would win. He'd be the guy who really isn't the government. Because Bernie Sanders has proven that he is the government. And why am I beating a dead horse? Because I read a story about it on lunch today and it was sad. Even though I opposed him, I felt sad for the guy. You know, integrity will free us all, said Max Cavallero of Sepultura. Integr Money isn't our God. Integrity will free us all. It's not the case in the Democrat Party. You know, money is their God. It's just, that's just what it is. There's nothing else. You know, you can, you can rattle your sabers at the Republicans and tell them they're idiots and they're God-loving and they're, they're science and they need to stop touting the Bible, but at least it gives them character. You know, at least, at least there's some character there. At least there's some belief in something. At least there's some passion there. At least they're not just lemmings. You have to give them that in a little bit. But I want to talk about this school. I want to talk about Aliyah Salim. And I want to applaud her. But I'm driving, so I can't. But I will say Aliyah Salim of the... Uh, I, could, I don't know how to pronounce it. The Jameh Al-Haddad Girls School. The Islamist Girls School in Nottingham. She was the whistleblower. The whistleblower. Okay, so this is an all-girls school that teaches the Islamist teachings. You go to the website and they tell you, uh, <coughs> due to the incredible demand, due to the incredible demand for, for the desire to learn the ways of Islam, we have opened this school at the Indoctrination Center. And in 2014, Aliyah Salim, beautiful name too, by the way, Aliyah Salim, decided that she wasn't going to take the nonsense of, of Islam. She wasn't going to take the radical nonsense of Islam. She wasn't going to listen to how, how gays should be punished or killed. Which is what the accusations were. Which is what she blew the whistle about. She came out and told the world about this place, which was an indoctrination center. And Ali Salim, you are everything we need in America. I invite you to come join the ranks here in America. Aliyah Salim, if you have people out there like you who aren't afraid to speak up against this radicalization of a religion, please send them our way. We need them here in America. We need them here in America badly. But Aliyah came out and she told the world what was really happening behind the closed doors of the Islamic Girls School in Nottingham. And we should be happy because they're closing their doors now. They're being pressured into closing their doors, and this place is going away. I can only imagine what a, a day's lesson plan would look like in there. Walk behind your man. Never speak up. Make sure you're covered. Uh, <laughs> Basically, we're teaching the women not to be women. We're teaching them to, to be serfs underneath of cowardice men who carry a book and wear dirty old robes. Aliyah Salim, I applaud you. I applaud you because you came out against this and you saw that it was terror. You saw that it was terror in the making and you stopped it. And it's a message to all Muslims out there. You can make such a difference. You can make such a difference. You just have to speak up when you see this radicalization. But what's the bigger story? The bigger story, well, no, not the, the biggest story is Ali Salim and her, her bravery. The underlying story is that places like these are built all over the world. Schools are being built all over the world under the guise of teaching the, 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 the path to peace through Islam. The path to peace that includes the stoning of, of gays, the, the murder of gays, the murder of women, the murder of women who've been raped, the, uh, 
clitorectomies of women, which if you don't know anything about that, that's a whole nother thing where I can't imagine a girl's school being very well populated. Are there teachings in Islam that are worth our time in this day and age? I'd say definitely. I'd say just as relevant as the Bible, probably, some of the teachings. The Bible's not as pure as the driven snow either, let's be honest about that. But what I will also say is that there, there are people who are practicing this, this the religion. They're, they're practicing the religion to the T. To the and it involves the heinous acts that are, are perpetrated against women. And these women are subject to being beaten and to being raped and all the other things. And, and to grow up in a world where you believe that that's what you're there for. That's what you've been put on this earth for. That's what Allah has planned for you. That's a terrifying thing. So I applaud Ali and Salim for pulling the veil over just one of these institutions of hate. Trust me, there are many more of these institutions of hate cropping up on a daily basis. As we bring in hundreds of thousands of uh, refugees from nations that don't necessarily like America to begin with. As we bring these folks in, you better believe we can expect more and more of this stuff. These are problems that are not going to go away. But we got one. We got one and people need to heed the warning and understand that just because it's Islam, just because you're scared of being called a Islamophobic and all that jargon, that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, that doesn't make it any less severe what they're teaching in these, in these uh, mosques, in these schools. Right? Just because you're afraid, just because you feel like you might be taken out of context or political correctness, that means nothing. And the long and short of it is it means nothing if people die because you didn't speak up. If people are sent out into this world with a hatred burning in their heart because you didn't have the, uh, the willpower to speak up, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And I just want you guys to understand that, that's all. That's the story, that's the scoop. That's the scoop on the Islamic school. It's a terrifying situation. Right there in Nottingham, right there in England. Indoctrination. Don't think it's not happening all around this country. We know it to be true. And to be honest, to be listen to me, to be honest, when I get on a topic like this and I think about the horrors of Islam that are out there that are growing in our nation, I'd pull the lever for Donald Trump right now just because of the fact that he's not going to bring in 65,000 more maniacs. Did you get that? Did your transcribers get all that? I'd pull the lever for Donald Trump today to know that he wouldn't bring in that many more monsters into the nation. And of course there's children, and of course there's... And of course... I know all that. I know people would be saved. Some percentage of people would be brought here on asylum and they would, you know what, they would live a great life. But I'm not comfortable with losing one American. That's the problem. I'm not comfortable with losing one American life to save 65,000 from another nation. Sorry. That's not an equation I like. Okay, I can't sacrifice your child, your wife, your loved one and do so comfortably. I can't do it. I can't sacrifice my neighbor any more than anyone else should feel comfortable sacrificing their neighbor for another cause, for another people from another land. Because at the end of the day, I still believe in America. I still believe in the borders of America. And I believe that, yes, Anyone should be able to come into this nation if they follow the process. I don't believe that you should be able to walk into this nation under asylum. And I don't believe that we, the American people, because let's be honest, Hillary brings them in, Barack Obama brings them in, their kids are never going to be affected. Whose kids are going to be affected? Whose kids are going to be affected? You want me to tell you the horrors that go on in my mind? You know, you guys talk with me about an hour or two hours a month, or two hours a week, rather, usually. We talk, we talk about various things. 
I stay on the surface of what I'm capable of when it comes to the horror that I envision. I stay on the surface. You can't... No one could live in the horror that I live in on a day-to-day -day basis because I have a creative mind and I know too much about what's possible out there. But my son was in a preschool. My son was in a preschool that was in the basement of a church. And there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't sit at work and worry about one of these immigrants, one of these asylees, or even worse, one of these natural born Americans who are somehow turned to radical Islam because they feel like uh, the world has been unfair to them and they haven't made as much money as they thought they would and they're what mean white people have more money. So I would sit here and I, w I would shudder at the thought of one of these monsters attacking this temple of Christian belief setting it on fire and my child being trapped in the bottom in the basement trapped trapped by the smoke succumbing to the smoke and the flames and like the Joker said in the in the uh, graphic novel the killing joke all it takes is one bad day to turn a person into a monster and I don't know what I would turn into if something like that happened to me I would shudder at the thought you know and he was going to a great school he was doing great things he spent a lot of time there. I think it was three hours a day. And when you have someone helpless like that depending on you and you, you, you shuffle them off into this world, you realize that's what it is. That's the terms. That's the terms. No matter how civil a world you think you live in, there are still wolves out there waiting for your kids. Waiting. Waiting in the, in the, in the, in the wing. Now... My issue is, if we bring in 60,000 more, I don't want even a hundred of them to be wolves. I don't want any of them to be wolves, and I don't want anyone to lose their child over the fact that we didn't even get a vote on this thing. We didn't get a vote on it. We didn't get to talk to a representative about it. No. Our government decided for us, whose main objective is to keep us safe, our government decided for us that we were going to take people from Syria. It was one of the few problems we didn't throw money across the ocean at. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I like Trump's plan to set up safe zones over there. Using, using their militaries. That's all. That's all. I'm not comfortable sacrificing your neighbor. Just like I'm not com comfortable sacrificing my neighbor to a war with Russia. I'm not comfortable with that. There are people in high places who are way too comfortable with that. Because we've reached such a level where these people who represent us are so far removed from the lifestyle that we live. They're so far removed. They live such a different lifestyle.